What's up? Did I scare you? Probably not as scared as I was when I saw how long it's been since I last uploaded. Hello, before I say anything else, this video is for a college project, but also just because I love Game of Thrones as well as English history, so it only made sense that I did this idea, and it's taken me so long to prepare this video, so I'm not gonna waste your time for asking you to subscribe and all that cliche stuff that I used to do in all my old videos. Let's just dive straight into all this. So today, as many of you have guessed, I'm going to go through just seven of the main Game of Thrones characters and all of their English historical counterparts. Uh, but of course, I won't be able to discuss every character, as this show is famous for having seemingly infinite character arcs and storylines, but I'll look at everyone's favourites and the most popular, but be sure to comment who your favourite character is down below. An obvious spoiler alert if you haven't watched Game of Thrones but really wish to, I would highly recommend you save this video for another time, as there's going to be many, many spoilers for every season here. But without further ado, let us begin our story. Westeros the home of the Seven Kingdoms, each warring with each other until one rival house stands tall among all others. A place where the line between staunch loyalty and treacherous betrayal is almost extinguished entirely. The home of tyrants, secret lovers, monsters, and schemers. It seems like the lore of this universe never ends, but how much of it was actual history in our world? As we know from the very beginning of Season 1, there's a palpable tension between the House of Stark and Lannister which gradually, as the seasons come and go, spirals out of control into all-out war with twists and bumps at every turn. But if we actually take a look at the two noble houses, we can see that even just by the names alone, Stark and Lannister, there is a blatant inspiration from the two English noble houses of York and Lancaster, who battled each other for supremacy and for the marble throne all throughout the late Middle Ages in what we know as the War of the Roses. This 30 long year war were grave times for England, and tens of thousands of men were butchered, tortured, and crippled for life, all for one dominant house to sit on the throne once the smoke had cleared the legendary Tudor dynasty. Near the end of episode 5 of season 1, we see Ned and King Robert arguing back and forth, and we get this little dialogue from the two. I want them both dead. You'll dishonor yourself forever if you do this. Honor? I've got seven kingdoms to rule! One king, seven kingdoms! So we can see now there is one king for the seven kingdoms. And what else consisted of seven kingdoms until the year 927? You guessed it, the Kingdom of England. Or, if you're a bearded giant from the north, Danelaw. Compared to Westeros's Dawn, the Reach, the Crownlands, Stormlands, the Westlands, Riverlands, the Vale, Iron Islands, and the biggest of them all, the North, England was made up of Wessex, Sussex, Essex, Kent, East Anglia, Mercia, and finally, Northumbria, each fighting for dominance. But as we know in hindsight, Alfred the Great saw to the domination of House Wessex all throughout this land, just as Robert Rathian did so with his noble house respectively. I mean, just come on, grab Ireland, flip it upside down, plop England on top, and boom, you have a near exact replica of Westeros. But now that we have set the premise of the land these lords and ladies find their demands, let us begin exploring each and every character. Number 1. Eddard Stark and Richard Duke of York The famed Honourable Eddard Stark was Warden of the North and ruled a jaw-dropping amount of land who was best friends with the King and a trusted advisor until Robert's crafty, plotting wife, the notorious Queen Cersei, split them apart and drove Ned away until he finally rebelled and consequently lost his head on her sinister, twisted orders to cover up for her perversions. His head is put up on a spike with all the other traitors of the Seven Kingdoms for all to see, and this tragic end for the character everyone rooted for seemed heartbreaking. But how much of his story is original? Let us take a look at one particular Richard, Duke of York. Born on the 21st of September in 1411 into a wealthy, upper-class family of five, Richard Plantagenet was a mighty duke and a famously honourable leader of men. He and his cousin Henry VI were close friends, and whilst Henry was a peaceful king with good intentions, he was far too weak to lead the kingdom in such troublesome times. So Richard, his trusted advisor and good friend, was appointed protector of the realm by Parliament in Henry's stead as they feared the Queen Margaret of Anjou's tyrannical rule. Things were going well, and the duke humbly served Henry for nearly a decade until Henry's wicked wife, Margaret, finally succeeded in driving them apart and caused such squabbles amongst them 
many of the English nobles were afraid to speak out of whom they supported. So one day, Richard asked them to give a sign to show whose side they were on. Let him that is a true-born gentleman and stands upon the honour of his birth, if he suppose I have pleaded truth from off this prayer, pluck a white rose with me. Saying that, he pulled a white rose which grew on a near bush and stuck it on his cap. Straight after, the loyalist Duke of Somerset sprang forward and tearing forth a red rose from another bush said, Let him that is no coward nor flatterer, but dare maintain the party of truth, pluck a red rose from off this thorn with me. Then one after another, all the nobles who were present plucked red or white roses. Those who were for Lancaster, that is the king, because he was descended from John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, wore red roses in their caps, and those who were for the Duke of York wore white roses in theirs. The fighting in court became fiercer and fiercer, until at last Margaret successfully convinced her weak-willed husband to dismiss Richard and appoint the more agreeable Edmund Beaufort, the powerful Duke of Somerset, to the role instead. Outraged, Richard gathered an army and marched for St. Albans with his white rose allies, where he met the Duke and his red roses, and in the terrible fighting that ensued, Richard emerged victorious over Edmund's dead body. Battle after battle raged and Yorkist victories became staggering, and the evil queen and her little seven-year-old boy Edward of Westminster fled to Scotland to escape their inevitable execution. King Henry and Richard eventually agreed under the 1460 Act of Accord that upon Henry's death, Richard will become the King of All England, illegitimizing his seven-year-old boy. This was too much for the Queen to contemplate, as she was a power-lusting woman who dominated all before her, and she would die before someone usurped her son's future throne. So she convened an army of Scotsmen and English loyalists, and marched for Wakefield, where the Duke and his two powerful allies, Richard Neville, Earl of Salisbury, and his son, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick. Yeah, they weren't too creative with their names back then. I'll do my best to make this whole family feud as least confusing as possible. However, the Queen outnumbered the so-called rebels two to one, and their army was crushed with no mercy. The Duke's 17-year-old boy, Edmund, Earl of Rutland, was found fleeing the battlefield by one John Clifford, who witnessed the boy beg for mercy, but John simply replied, By God's blood, thy father slew mine at St. Albans, and so will I do thee. Oh, thy kid. Before plunging his sword into the poor boy's brains, Richard and the Earl of Salisbury were captured and given mock trials. The Duke was crowned with cattails, which are sort of like reeds that you would find at a lake, and received insults hurled towards him, such as, Hail the king without rule! Hail the duke without heritage! After all this, he was beaten before being beheaded and had a paper crown set upon his head and put up on the highest wall of York for all his people to see. This inspiration for Ned Stark has always been one of my favourites, as it was a classic tale which could not possibly be thought up with, and I'm very glad to see a near reconstruction of this famous duke in the HBO TV series, A Game of Thrones. Both men were honourable leaders and valiant knights who only stood for what was right, but was driven away from their friends, the kings, by their cruel, power-hungry wives, and butchered for all to see on the walls of the city. Eddard was a key character whom everyone imagined would be the protagonist in the coming seasons and did not even consider the possibility of his death in such a barbaric manner. And it got the fans of the show ready for seven more seasons of shocking, unexpected betrayal in the most unforeseen times. <coughs> <coughs> Now this is just one comparison out of seven characters which I want to discuss, but I'm limited by the time constraints of my college FMP, so I'll leave this video here and I'll upload the full 40 or so minutes version of my regular YouTube channel. But until I eventually get round to doing that, I hope you learned a thing or two from this video, and I'll try to make the full version soon enough, but until then, I'll see you later.